Well, good evening. Welcome to sunny Somerville, South Carolina. It's good to have you here. I don't know how many are on, on board. I know it's the middle of the summer, so if I get anybody, I am pleased and, and, and I appreciate you tuning in uh, and doing this. We are on John 10 and 11. That means after this, we'll be more than halfway through, finishing by the end of August. Um, we will have seen six of the seven signs, um, and we're going to re go over those later, and then five um, of the I am statements. So there's seven signs, remember, and seven I am statements um, that uh, we deal with throughout the Gospel of John. Uh, so we begin with a, two of them in chapter 10. This could be called the Good Shepherd Sermon. And you'll look at verse 1. It says, He who does not enter by the door into the fold, it could be door or gate. All right. You know, so, you know, unless we enter through a door or a gate into the sheepfold, we are like a thief and a robber. All right. Meaning uh, we can't bypass the gate. And later we know that Jesus will identify that he is the gate or he is the door. Um, and if not, you are robbing him of his glory and, and the false shepherds do that. You know, why glory? Well, you th I was thinking about that today. And you're thinking about the first couple of commandments, have no gods and no idols before. You know, why did God, does God, is he arrogant? Does he need glory? Or perhaps it is, is that by us giving him glory and the word is honor, we are actually putting him first. We are obeying the greatest commandment of all to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Jesus doesn't need it. Jesus is not arrogant. He knows when you give him glory, you got your mind on the right thing and in the right place. Think about it, all right? So who's there anyway? We go from chapter 9 to chapter 10. In 9, we have the Pharisees. We had the disciples. The blind man, perhaps, from chapter 9 is still there. Um, and of course, there's you and there's me. There's the readers and there's the hearers. He is speaking to us. He is saying, you know, we have to go through the door or the gate in order to get into the sheepfold. All right. Verse two. But the shepherd who teaches otherwise is, is not sharing the truth. All right. He, it, the shepherd who does share it or takes you to the right gate, if you will, is the one who is leading you in the right direction. Now, the shepherd here is small s. It's not talking about what later Jesus would refer to himself as the good shepherd. So it's talking about people who are responsible to give you, tell you the gospel and to tell you about Christ and what he did for you, and they seem never to get around to that. All right? We're going to see a little bit more what that means. See, this shepherd, or it will, in verse 3, to him the doorkeeper or the gatekeeper opens. Now the question is, this is not talking about Jesus. Who is, in, chap in verse 3, the gatekeeper or the doorkeeper? I believe it's the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that opens the door. Remember chapter 6, all right? Twice we're told that no one comes to the Father unless the Spirit draws him. It's the Spirit who draws us into the right gate and into the sheepfold or into the, into the life of the community of faith or the people of God. All right, opens the way to Jesus Christ. There we hear the shepherd's voice, and he calls his sheep, verse 3, by name. That's very important for the rest of this chapter. The shepherd guides, and the sheep knows his voice because he cares for them, and he cares for their needs. You see, the shepherd knows the sheep, and the sheep know the shepherd. What? Very important. Look at verse 5. However, verse 5, there is a stranger. The stranger simply doesn't care. All right? The stranger is a counterfeit shepherd. A stranger is one who's called into the ministry of the, of the sheep and yet doesn't care about the sheep. He, the sheep uh, do not follow him because they don't recognize his voice. They don't hear Jesus' word coming through him or her. The voice is unfamiliar. It sounds like Jesus, but it really isn't. Huh. Then this, in verse 6, it said this is a word picture, and they don't understand it. It's beyond them. So Jesus has to get more direct in verse 7. He states plainly, I am the gate. I am the door. I am the one. 
This is the third I am statement. All right. All the other ones he said had come before me are counterfeit shepherds. They're phonies. Don't listen to them. They'll rob you of the truth. What will they rob you of? They are thieves because they'll rob you of the truth about Jesus. And the sheep don't know their voice. So he repeats it in verse 9. I am the door. I am the entry point into the sheepfold. Come through me, he says, and be in the fully in God's presence. Go in and out and find pasture. Verse 9 is very important. Go in and find pasture is a Hebrew idiom. And that idiom basically says, and it would be replicated in verse 10, that you will have the freedom of movement, the freedom of living fully in God's presence. He says, when the thieves in verse 10, he says, the fraudulent shepherds, those who don't really aren't interested in your spiritual war welfare, it, if they did their ministry, it'd be about Jesus first, but it isn't. You see, the thieves and the robbers, it's all about themselves. But loyalty to Christ leads to life of abundance and fullness of life. And there we get to the fourth I am statement in verse 11. He says, I am the good shepherd. In verses what? To the bad ones he's talking about, the ones he calls strangers, the ones that he calls thieves and robbers. He said, there are those who make a living out of the ministry that aren't telling the truth. Whoa, we could go off on a tangent on that one, couldn't we? All right. The hired hand in verse 12. See, the hired hand who not, doesn't, that, those aren't his sheep. All right? He doesn't own those sheep. He has no investment. He has no ownership in the sheep. If something, a crisis occurred and the wolf comes and he goes, sayonara, I'm out of here. You know, I'm going north and everything goes south. You know, he's not going to be there. He's not going to lay his life down for the sheep. He's going to take off and protect himself first. You see, the hireling, the hired hand, think about this. It's a job to him. It's not a ministry. It's a job. It's not a calling. Jesus is called to lay down his life in substitutionary sacrifice for our sins. He came to give us life. And he goes, I know I am the good shepherd and I know who belongs to me and they know that I belong to them. And then in verse 16, he says, but there's other sheep. There's other sheep that are not here yet. And what he's talking about, they're not in the sheepfold yet, but they will be. And we believe that's a reference to the Gentiles or to Jews that are outside of the nation of Israel, but, but predominantly to Gentiles. All right. Jesus' mission, therefore, is not just to the nation of Israel. His mission is global, and that's what the, the apostles are called to carry out. It's, it's, that's what it means to be an apostolic church, all right, um, with one purpose, one shepherd, one flock. One shepherd, Jesus Christ, one flock, the people of God, like Paul says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. The father, he says, loves me. In verse 17, he says, this reason he loves me because I lay down my life for the sheep. He gives it all. The hireling, in, in contrast, will only give enough to what, so they get something out of it. Jesus expresses his own authority, by the way, in verse 17, when he says, I lay down my, my life. This is one of the few times he doesn't say it's the Father's authority, although in verse 18, notice, he says, this authority was given to me by the Father. He is the gate of the sheep, the third I am statement. He is the good shepherd. He is the one, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures so that we can go in and out. We can have fullness of life. We can have an abundant life in Him. Well, look at verse 19. Verse 19, mine says a division occurred. Well, who would have thunk it? <laughs> you know, every time Jesus says some profound things, everybody scratches their head, or other people try to figure out how they can countermand what He said. All right? And here in verse 20, 19, 20, he says, again, and what do they say? The first person, many of them say, actually, this guy is nuts. This guy thinks he's God. <laughs> he's got to be nuts. He talks like a man possessed. He's demon possessed. Others say, wait a minute. I'm not so sure about that. They're hesitant to just label Jesus, to personify him. How can a demon possessed man 
give sight to a man who was born blind. How could he do it? And so the debate continues. And I want you to stop real, real fast right here, right? second in verse 21. What are they really asking? The same thing that John and Jesus have been asking throughout the entire gospel. Who is this man called Jesus? This is the whole point of the gospel, is to make us decide. And he's going to ask Martha later on, do you believe this in, in chapter 11? The real question is, do you and I believe this? And in believing, what does it mean? Believing, again, pisteo, the Greek word, means to lay out your life upon him. Trust him with your whole being, to love God with our, all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. All right? So what happens in verse 22, we get to the Feast of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication. Now, Hanukkah actually is a feast that comes out of, out of when the Syrians were sacking, if you will, or invading Jerusalem about 165 to 164 B.C. It's called the Maccabean Revolt. And what happened is they were setting up all kinds of revolting images right in the temple. You know, and it was some call it the abomination of desolation. This is the the thing that is called in Daniel, and then later in Second Thessalonians. Uh, there, they, arguably, there's more than one, but this one is particular in that period of time. In one, and they they reconsecrate, if you will, or consecrate the temple with the eight lights of Hanukkah, and that's where it comes from. All right, twenty four says the Jews gather around him. They're saying. Don't you love it? Here's what they, you know, they've been listening to this man for who knows how long. And they say, all right, that's it. Stop being coy. Just tell us who you are, you know. If you're the Messiah, just speak plainly. And Jesus says, ha, being coy, I've already told you again and again and again. And if you don't believe what I say, believe what I do. If you don't believe what you say who I, I, who I say I am, believe what I do. I do the works of the Father. Jesus says, you don't get it because you're not one of my sheep. You're not one of mine. And if you were, verse 27, I believe, yes, my sheep hear my voice. They hear my word. See, when you're a child of God through, in, in Jesus Christ, this Bible, this word speaks to you. You hear the voice of Jesus through it. The word of God becomes the word of life for you. In verse 27. And it, you will experience him. You will know him. I love when Paul says to know him in the power of his resurrection. Know is, in the, is the same word in the Greek text in the, what is called the Septuagint in the Old Testament. When it says Adam knew Eve, it's a personal intimate knowledge of God through Jesus Christ. I know him. And then thirdly, that we would walk with him and have companionship with him in 27. In verse 28 he says, My sheep I give eternal life, everlasting, deep, abiding abundant life and they will never die they will never die because i always have them in my hand and i like how one commentator says it he says my sheep are always in my grip and i will never let them go and matter of fact my father who is greater than all else he gave these sheep to me and he won't let them go either and so not only do you get the assurance that Jesus won't let you go, but he also get the assurance that the Father won't let you go. Believe me, this is eternal security. This is Jesus saying, once you're in the fold, you stay in the fold. You're in there, and you are in his grip for eternity, for life. And then he, in verse 30, says, by the way, I and the Father are one. Now it's interesting because the word "one" is not is in the what is not feminine or, or masculine. It's what is in the neuter, and what it means here is that I and the Father are of the same essence, the same identity. It's what they argued in the early councils. What exactly is who is Jesus, and and is he truly the the monogenes, the only begotten of the Father? So we get to verse thirty-one. And just like after Jesus said, before Abraham was uh, born, I existed. Here he says, they picked up stones to, st to stone him. I got a little bit out of sequence there. And what I wanted to say was is that they picked up stones. Isn't that what they do? 
Remember the woman caught in adultery? Let's pick up stones, all right? Be, Jesus says before Abraham in, 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 in chapter 8, verse 58, before Abraham was born, I existed. Before he existed, I existed. And they said, what, you're not even 50 years old, and they want to pick up stones and, and do it. And here again in verse 31, they want to stone him again. <laughs> Jesus says, I've done a lot of really cool things, man. I've done a lot of amazing things. Which one are you going to stone me for? Which one? What good work are you going to kill me for? Well, it's not what you do that bothers us, they said in verse 33. It's what you say. Hmm. See, you're a blasphemer, Jesus, because you, being a man, call yourself God. You call yourself God. They get the message, see? They understand what he's saying because they say, we heard you say you're God. So they do get the message. They just don't receive it. And Jesus then goes back to the Old Testament. Verse 34, it's a little confusing. He, you know, even for me as I've gone over it a couple times, he quotes Psalm 82, 6, and it's, he goes, doesn't your law say that, uh, that you are God's? You know, I think it should be small g. And anyway, and he says, and, and he, why does he bring that up? Because the, he, it, in Psalm 82, it's referring to the judges of that time, those like in court of law, where they had to make judgments. And they made judgments based on the Word of God. Jesus says if they made judgments on the Word of God, what about the Word of God who is standing before you? Do I not have right to do the same thing? He implies, and let me read it, if it is permissible to call men gods because they use God's Word in judgment, how much more can the Son of God or the Word of God be called God? For the scripture is not broken. You see, the scripture is constant. What, is, what was true then is true now. 34 and 35, I believe. 36, you say I blaspheme, he says. He says this to the leaders. And although my father consecrated and sent me because I said I am the son of God, if my works are not of God, he says, don't believe me. Don't believe I'm God's son, verse 37. Uh, we get to 38, but if I do this, and it comes from dad, <laughs> you know, if my, it, if my works validate my words, if my works validate my words, even though you don't believe what I say, believe what I do. I mean, how can you ignore the fact that this blind man who never saw can now see? How can you ignore all these miracles and signs? Because they don't want to hear it. Once again, he, he, he had, they attempt to get Jesus in their grip. Verse 39, they try to grab him and get him and to take him to trial, but Jesus eludes them. And so 40, the end of the chapter, 40 through 42, in 40 it, it says, he went away beyond the Jordan. Now this is a, a kind of a cool, we come full circle. Now watch this. He goes to the place where John was baptizing. And if we go to chapter 1, that's where we are introduced to John, and he's baptizing in the same area that Jesus now visits. Is there any? Kind of, it's kind of cool, isn't it? Um, he, so many at that point begin to be hearing the word at the place where this all began. <laughs> You know, many saw Jesus said, and they said, John didn't do signs, and John didn't even call, you know, attention to himself. You know, he said, I must decrease that he might increase. And then he goes on and he says, but John says, you need to look at this guy, you know, and, and listen to what he says. And so many believed in Jesus, verse 42, in him, in the place that they first heard the word from John the Baptist. Chapter 10, how are we doing? Man, we're doing good. I'm going to get you out early tonight. <laughs> All right, maybe, maybe not. Chapter 11 is fun because it's what I call the sixth sign. It's the resuscitation which, or the resurrection of Lazarus, Jesus' buddy. Um, you got to like this because now we're moving into a family. All right. In verse one, a certain man. I, I, I was curious why John put it that way. But and then he names him Lazarus, and he names where he's from, of Bethany, in the village of Mary and Martha. We know Mary and Martha. Luke ten thirty eight through forty two. Mary is the one who will anoint Jesus in the next chapter, chapter twelve. Although there are many who point to Luke seven at the end of that chapter, and that was the woman that's describing Mary when she wipes his feet 
with her hair and her tears. All right, that's two. So the sisters send word to him, your close friend is dying. You know, what do you do when you get that phone call? What do you do when you find out somebody that's really dear to you? You know, you, you want to act immediately, don't you? You want to do something, you know? You want to at least get on the phone, you know, whatever it is, and talk to somebody, talk to the, their spouse, talk to, you know, what their child. Um, but their, his close friend is sick. And I wrote down here, even God's friends get sick. Jesus says, this sickness is not unto death. Verse 4, i got to turn the page here. When he heard this, he said, this sickness is not the end. This is not the end. He's not going to end in death. Uh, uh, it will glorify God. And I, I thought back to the blind man in chapter 9. Remember when he said, did this man sin or did his parents? And, and Jesus says, neither. You know, this is for the glory of God. Once again, it, it, what, why? Because it focuses on the right person to glorify or honor God. All right, verse 4, Jesus will be glorified too. You know, in verse 4, he says, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. How will he be glorified? When he raises Lazarus from the dead. All right. Anyway, that takes us, because he says, I think we'll wait for a while. You ever wonder what Jesus was thinking for those two days? That he said he's just going to wait around. He didn't move for two days. He was going to hang on there and wait. And then after two days, he says to his, his, his disciples, his, his buddies, you know, his team, hey, it's time to go to Bethany. It's time to go and, and visit Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Uh, okay. And the disciples say, you can't go back there. In verse 8. You can't go back there, 11 eight. You can't because they tried to stone you in the last chapter. All right? They're always trying to stone you. You can't go. They're going to kill you if you go there. And Jesus says something a little bit cryptic. Well, you got to walk in the day. And the day is 12 hours. You got to walk when you can see things clearly. You got to walk when you can discern the will of God because night's coming. He's going to be crucified, what? Not much more than a week later or something like that, you know? And you got to be able to discern God's will when you can because there's going to be times, friends, and we all know it, who have followed him for a while, there's times where God seems silent. St. John calls it the dark, side, the dark night of the soul. There's times we just don't know what God wants us to do. We don't know what God's doing in our life, and sometimes we even question it. But we question, shouldn't have Jesus got up, made a phone call right away, and got over to Lazarus' house? Well, he didn't do it. Two days later, he gets there. And he says to them, our friend Lazarus, he's sleeping. He's asleep. <laughs> and I'm going to go wake him up. <laughs> and they're like, oh, good. He's not dead. He's just sleeping. Let him sleep. He'll get better. You know, he needs to sleep. You know, John in his commentary says, and he, he says Jesus was actually talking literally that, about him being dead. And then he has Jesus quote it in verse 14. No, he's not sleeping, you guys. It's a euphemism. He's dead. Paul uses it sleep in, in 1 Corinthians 15 in the, in the so-called resurrection chapter. But, verse 15, I'm really glad, I'm really glad that this is happening this way. All right? I'm really glad I wasn't there. Because what, and this is going to help grow your faith. Because when you get there and you see what happens, <laughs> when, he's, when he is taken and comes out of that tomb, you're going to go, wow, <laughs> your faith is going to grow exponentially. Well, Thomas hears that in verse 16, and he says, yeah, yeah. You know Thomas. He's called twin, right? I love it. Somebody suggested he's called twin or Didymus because he is two-souled is the way it in the Greek. Two-souled. Right? S-O-U-L-E-D. Two, has two souls. He's believer and he's unbeliever in the same person. Lord, help me in my unbelief. Because we all know the story. Hey, man, unless I can put my fingers in here and in his side, I won't believe it. Unless I can see him, I won't believe it. And then when he does see him, he, he kneels before him and says, my Lord and my God. Believer, unbeliever. He's a twin. Verse 16. But he says, let's go die with him. Well, what does he mean? Is he like, oh, well, I can't, another, you know, the resignation... Or is he saying, let's go mourn with the family. Let's go, because they're my friends too. 
Anyway, verse 17, Jesus has his conversation first with, I'll call her impetuous. Some would call her driven. Some would call her type A, Martha. All right, conversation with Martha. Martha. Jesus arrives and now we're told that Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days. We'll get to what that means in a second. Well, I'll get to it now. See, my notes are right there. Yeah. What happens to the Jews in their theology believe that the, the soul would hover around the place of burial for three days. All right. But on the fourth day, the soul departed. So on the fourth day is when Jesus shows up. Why is that important? We want to know that Lazarus is good and dead. I mean, there is no coming back from this one unless you're Jesus. Well, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived in Bethany, and Bethany was close. It was only two miles away, as it tells us, and that's important because it allowed the mourners and their friends from Jerusalem to travel that distance and come and spend time with the family. They, they came to the funeral home and, you know, they, 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 they waited in line and then they stayed the next day for the funeral, you know, just like we would do. Not exactly, but anyway. <laughs> Martha hears that Jesus is showing up and she's like, all right, let's go. Mary's over there, doesn't move, just sits there. All right. Now the question is, is Mary upset or is she just sitting in, in prayer? I don't know. I'm going to go on the other one and say, I think she's despondent. I think she's discouraged. She's thinking, where have you been? Where's he been? Four days. Four days. He's been dead. Anyway, Martha runs out to find him. Why she leaves Mary in the house. Martha sees Jesus and it's like, hey, how you doing? Jesus, no. <laughs> no, six foot away. Anyway, <laughs> Lord, if you were here. Lazarus would not have died. My brother would not have died. As if he had to be there. If you were here, he wouldn't have died. Wait, wait a minute. What about chapter 4 in the synagogue official's son, you know? He, he cured him from a distance. He could have done that with Lazarus, but he had an intention to be there and a purpose to do it in, in, when he was there and, and that, that whole thing can be played out, all right? But now that you're here, I know God will answer whatever you ask, all right? All he needed is to be present. Well, no. Jesus looks at her in verse 24 and 25, and he says, Hey, chill it, girl. You know, be cool. I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he die, shall live. And he that lives and believes in me shall never, never die. And then he asks an interrogative. He says, Do you believe this? Verse 25, the fifth I am statement, all right? Jesus says, yes, the body will die physically, but Lazarus will never die spiritually. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit, all right? Jesus says, do you believe this, Martha? Martha? Remember earlier, I, yeah, the question was, who is this man? And now the question is, do you believe in this man? Do you, I mean, Frederick Bruner says that believing is not a one-time act. It is a continual act of, of giving your life over to Christ. It is believing in him. Do you believe this? Martha is already a believer, but, you know, he's asking her again to reaffirm her own faith. All right, just like the Presbyterians do in their church. All right, do you believe this, Martha? And Martha's confession in verse 27. Yes, I do, Jesus. Yes, I do, Lord. I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God. You are the coming one, the prophet out of Deuteronomy 18 that Moses prophesied. So then we get to the next conversation. This conversation was Jesus and Mary. All right, because Martha runs back after she has this conversation with Jesus and he runs back to the house and there's Mary, I guess, still sitting there uh, and, and says, hey, the, the teacher is calling for you. Isn't that neat? He's calling for you. He's, he's, he's asking, he's bidding you to come. And with that, Mary gets a resurgence of hope and she gets up and she goes to find him and she goes to the same place. It says in the next verse that, that, that Martha and Jesus had the conversation as if maybe that's important. They had it on the same ground, if you will. 
Jesus remained there and he, as he spoke with Martha, he now spoke with Mary. Mary gets up and the mourners, they think, well, she must be going to mourn at the tomb and so let's follow her and let's grieve with her. But she wasn't going to mourn. She was going to meet the author of life. So Mary meets Jesus and what does she do? I mean, it, it, it has to be intentional. She falls at his feet. Remember in Luke 10, it was Mary that, that, that sat at Jesus' feet. That's her familiar posture, is to, is to sit at his feet. And she repeats verbatim. She repeats verbatim what Martha said in verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Again, you know, there's some kind of this location. No, it's not about where I'm at. It's about who I am. And when Jesus saw her, now we get into Jesus' humanity in a way that we hardly see this glimpse other than in the garden when he says, take this cup away from me. And he sees them weeping and he sees the mourners from Jerusalem and he sees his friends and he sees Mary and Martha and they're weeping and they're mourning and his heart sinks. And what actually the, the Greek there is, is incredible because it says that he's hurting deep down and he's actually almost agitated. He's so troubled by what he sees. Where's the grave? Verse 34. Where have you laid him? And then the shortest verse in the whole Bible, right? All right, you want to memorize a verse tonight? There you go. Verse 1135, Jesus wept. He wept over everything I just said. He wept over human suffering. As God weeps over human suffering, as God weeps over all the stuff that we've been talking about for the last several months, God is in the midst of this. It's like that woman who said, where were you when my son died? And God the Father said in the same place where my son died, right by his side. Right by his side. He weeps. God is not this intolerant, unyielding God that, that, that agnostics and people who don't believe him want to paint him out. You know, when they hear of catastrophe, where was your God? How could God let this happen? Well, he weeps. And I believe he weeps for everyone who dies. And I, I believe he weeps for, for all, the, the way that sometimes we turn our back from him. Well, there's a disagreement and when Jesus is weeping and he's crying and there's, they're watching him, maybe the mourners in and, and verse 36 and 37. And then one of them, are, it's positive, and they say, well, what? He's so, look at his sympathy. Look at how he feels. And then there's the cynics. Well... If he healed the blind man, if he had made let the blind man see, why couldn't he do something with Lazarus? You know, maybe he can't. Maybe death has defeated the big Jesus, you know? <laughs> so he came to that place, I'm at vision, vision now, a tomb, a cave, if you will, a stone road in front of it. Is that familiar to you at all? And again, it says he's deeply moved, deeply troubled by what he is seeing. And he says to them, move the stone. Move the stone. This time it takes human hands. The next stone that gets moved gets moved by an angel. <laughs> anyway, Martha says, Lord, you can't do this. I love this. It's, he's been in there four days. And you know what that means? He stinks. I mean, oh, you don't, you don't want to go in. Oh, my gosh, he's going to stink. And Jesus says, don't worry about it. You just trust me, Martha. <laughs> You're about to see something that's going to blow your mind. This is, as I said, the sixth sign. The first sign. Let's see how many of us can do this. First sign, what was it? That's right, water and a wine. Well, maybe I can't do that. Second sign, this, the official, the, the son who, is, who Jesus heals from a distance, right? The third sign, the lame man, the lame man in chapter 5 at the Pool of Siloam. The fourth sign, the feeding of the 5,000. The fifth sign, the blind man at the gate, at, at the temple gate in chapter 9. And now the sixth sign, chapter 11, Lazarus. So we've now done six signs in five I am statements. The last two being 14.6 and 15.1. We'll get to that in a couple weeks. All right? Trust me, you're about to see the sixth sign. 
the stone is moved and Jesus looks up in prayer and I like what he does. He goes, Father, I'm not, you know, you and I are cool. I mean, we, you know, we, we already, we're already simpatico. But I'm going to pray like, I'm going to look up and I, because I want people to know that I come from you. All right. He commands with a loud voice. This, I love this one. He goes, Lazarus. Remember, he calls his sheep by name. Lazarus, come out of there. All right, the stone is gone, and all of a sudden, you, you know, you see him coming out. You know, I've seen pictures of that, you know, movies and stuff like that. I remember one preacher way back in my early days as a Christian, a pastor from Cleveland, he used to say, he, he had to say, Lazarus, come out. Because if he just said, come out, everybody in that tomb would have come out. So he had to make sure he only got Lazarus. Anyway, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he comes out, and he's wrapped in his garments of death. In the, and around his face and around his body. And what does God do when, he re, when we are resuscitated from death into life? He takes off all those, those old accoutrements. He takes off all those deadly garments. He, Paul says, put aside all those things and put on the new things. And this is what he's doing with Lazarus. He's unbound. And now he's free to go home and to continue his life. Could you imagine, and we'll find out more about him in chapter 12, what it'd be like to be Lazarus? I mean, how would you, what was he going through in those four days? I mean, cool, isn't it? Anyway, we're getting close to the end here because more division, verse 45 and 46. Many of the Jews, it said, uh, who came for comfort actually received comfort. You get that? They believed. So they came not knowing that they were going to experience a life-transforming event in their lives. They were going to see Lazarus rise, but they're going to rise too, <laughs> just in a different way. It's called spiritual transformation. Uh, but there's some, and this kills me, there's some who went to tattle. There's some who went to the, back to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, and, and reported what they saw. And some would say, well, they were just giving information, but I believe what they were doing is they were trying to ex expedite um, getting Jesus captured and dead. Because that's what happens next in the last verses of chapter 11, 47 through 57. They take it back to the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of, of Jerusalem, the uh, religious leaders, and they ask the question, watch what they do. What do we do now? What do we do now? We can't dispute what, that a, a significant, unbelievable thing happened in Bethany. Too many people saw this. We can't dispute it. And if this keeps happening, verse 48, I love it. They start to go, yeah, if this keeps happening, we're going to lose everything. Rome's going to bring down the hammer. They're going to take away our nation. They're going to take away our temple. Huh. And everybody will believe in him. And I love that, you know, that global language. Everybody's going to believe. Everybody's going to go crazy over Jesus. So we got to stop this right now. And here's what Caiaphas does is he prophesies. You guys don't get it. You don't understand what's happening here. You know, it's like in the movie Jesus Christ Superstar. I mean, I mo probably most of you never seen it. He, you know, he gets up and he says, this Jesus must die. This, he mu must die, must die. This Jesus must die. For the sake of the nation, Jesus must die. Or another movie, The Wrath of Khan. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. We got to kill this guy. We got to get rid of him. You don't understand what a threat he is. And unwittingly and inaccurate, or accurately, he predicts Jesus' imminent death. That it won't only affect Israel, but it's going to affect even God's children beyond Israel, Jew and Gentile alike. Like Paul says, to the Jew first and then to the Greek, it is the most important message ever. And so from that day, verse 53, they go plotting and scheming. And they begin to figure out how they can eliminate the threat that Caiaphas prophesied. Well, Jesus experienced a brief respite again in 54. I think John takes them in and out because to show us, like all the other Gospels do, that Jesus is human and sometimes he needs to get away from it all. He needs to get away from it, frankly, and hide. All right? He goes to a city called Ephraim before. Why? Because he's about to end, enter the final week of his life. 
Chapter 12 has Palm Sunday. Where, you know, he's going to be dead on Friday. And it's not that far away, the following Friday, I should say. So then he describes the preparations in, in the last couple verses of chapter 11 for the Passover. They need to be cleansed, ceremonial cleansed or purified. And what they're really talking about here is that Passover is getting in. See, John's setting you up for the big Passion Week, Jesus' final week. And people are going, where is he? Remember, they did that before in the Feast of Tabernacles back in chapter 7. Where is this guy? Will he show? And this is what they tell all the people, the religious leadership. If you see him, you do what those other people did after they saw Lazarus rise from the grave. You come and you tell us right away. You let us know. Why? Because they're plotting and scheming. So they can finally put an end to this Jesus thing. It has to end here and now. We got a plan, and our plan it includes a guy named Judas. We're going to complete our treachery. And they're doing, this is so beautiful, they're doing exactly what God had planned all along. And they were helping to accomplish God's master plan for us. God is good all the time. All the time. God is good. I'd like to pray for a family in our former church who lost their son at age 32 and just lift up that family and lift up other concerns that I know are in your hearts right now. Pray with me. Pray that we would continue to see God's hand and His purpose and presence in all that we're going through, either through the COVID-19 or through um, all the protests and everything, that we can have our eyes open to what He wants us to hear, that we would never close our hearts to other people's lives and other people's predicaments and situations. Help us, to, help us Lord, to be like You. Help us to love our enemies. Help us to pray for our enemies. And help us to turn the other cheek. Help us do all the things that our teacher, our rabbi, taught us to do. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you that you as the good shepherd laid down his life <clears throat> at Calvary so that we might live, that we might have eternal life, that we might know that we are forgiven, that we might know, Lord, that we can live an abundant life in you that the Holy Spirit will dwell in us, Lord, not from the time we confess you to the time we go home and for eternity. And Lord, that eternal life isn't just in the by and by, but it's here and now. I pray, Lord, for this family, and I pray for the young man who died. I ask, Lord, that it be especially with them as they grieve the loss of such a young person. I pray that you'll gather around them, Lord, as we talked, uh, Lord, and that some way that the gospel has, it's the seed of the word of God has penetrated his soul. Uh, Lord, we pray for the, those who have been hurt and, and even those who have lost loved ones through COVID-19, that you'd be with all of them. Help, Lord, the cases to go down. Help us, Lord, to move in a, in a, a direction that includes you. Help us to, un, to glorify you as you've called us to do. Uh, Lord, I pray, Lord, that for justice and peace and equity in our country, help us to understand how we can be peacemakers and peacekeepers, if you will, uh, Lord, and not people who try to divide like we see so much in the Gospel of John. Help us to bring people together in your love and help us to extend and proclaim that love in a way that other people would be drawn to the Lord of glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much. See you next week. And then a week after that, by the way, we'll be taking a break, but I'll tell you more about that next week. Bye.